At this hour in our homes in this place, whether gathered or scattered, we are the body of Christ. A warm welcome to all who join us for worship today, whether you've been a part of this church family for many years or if you're worshiping with us for the first time. We hope you will find comfort, connection, challenge, and love here at Salem United Church of Christ. My name is Marcia Meyer. I'm the Director of Youth and Family Ministries at Salem, and I will serve as our worship leader today. Good morning. Let us begin our worship as we sing the hymn, God, Give to God Immortal Praise.
join me in the unison prayer of confession. There are far too many times, O Lord, when we have neglected or ignored the needs of others because it wasn't convenient for us to help. We backed away with excuses on our lips and indifference in our hearts. Forgive us and set us on the right path of service and compassion in the name of Jesus, who modeled faithful living for us. Remind us that we are residents of a global community. Help us to hear the plight of those who have been voiceless with the gifts that we have and the love of Christ. Direct our lives in compassionate service to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Through the abundance of God's mercy and forgiving love, you are empowered to be disciples, to reach out to others, to offer the words and deeds of hope in a struggling world. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, Creator, Sustainer, Redeemer, you make your presence known to us in many ways. Fill us this day with your warmth, your power, your strength. Help us to see our lives with the freshness born of the Spirit. Lift up the blessings, the loved ones, the ones we treasure for simply being themselves, the ones we laugh with, the ones who teach us to trust ourselves, and hold close to the ones who are ill this day, to those in need of healing. Stand by those who know their time is limited. Fill them and us with courage and peace. We lift up prayers today for Drew, for Pastor and Abby and John and their family, for Chad, for David and Shar and Marlene, and the prayer requests that have come to us online. Prayers for recovery from knee replacement surgery Wednesday and continued prayers for my sister Judy. Gracious one, release us from our burdens. We bring the memories of the past, times when we have fallen short, times when we were hurt. We have fear, worries of what will be and how we will make do. We are carried away with the daily issues that press upon us. Help us to let go and trust that you will see us through. We look at ourselves, the advantages we've been given, the opportunities we have seized. Fill us, O oh God, with a sense of gratitude for the gifts that you have given to us, our knowledge, skills, and hard-won insights. Nudge us to give back, to reach out, to share our gifts and our lives with those who are discouraged. Oh, there's another prayer request. Prayers for David Buckelbud, who's been diagnosed with ALS. Gracious God, grab our attention and seize us with the brightness of day, with the miracles of life itself, that we might be filled with new passion, new resolve, heeding your quiet call to take the next step. Amen.
Our scripture reading from the Hebrew text comes from Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians come and dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shephira and the other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew, Hebrew women, and see them on their birth stool. If it is a boy, kill them. If it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this? And allowed the boys to live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born by the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man came from the house of Levi, went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at the distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds, sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get a nurse from the Hebrew woman and nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me. I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him Pharaoh's daughter and soon took him in as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The next verse is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. It speaks of the new life in Christ. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. 
prophecy in proportion to faith ministry in ministering the teacher in teaching the exhorter and exhortation the giver and generosity the leader in diligence the compassionate in cheerfulness and the gospel reading from Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 20 now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea of Philippi he asked his disciples who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered them, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. We will continue with special music. Here I am, Lord. Thank you. 
Pastor sent me his sermon early this morning, so we'll give this a try. If you open up the Gospels, you will find and find a picture of Jesus and what he looks like. You see a picture of Jesus who likes to ask people a lot of questions, especially if he's challenged. Jesus would often answer with a question, a question with another question. Most of us ask questions to fill in gaps in our understanding. We expect that especially of small children, inquisitive minds trying to make sense of all that is around them. We do it to clarify information we've been given. I'm not sure that's why Jesus asked questions. There weren't gaps in Jesus' understanding. Then why would he be asking questions? Perhaps questions were a way that Jesus had for folks to realize certain things and to open up the world for them. In the same and in some way, those questions actually make the world more complex rather than more simple. I think that sort of thing can be said for our lesson in Matthew's Gospel today. Jesus and his disciples were in a region of Caesarea, Caesarea, Philippi, in the furthest northernmost region of the land of ancient Israel. And while they were there, he asks his disciples this question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Now this sort of question is terribly hard-hitting. There's simple reportage, it is parroting back what they've heard from others. There's poll taking, which shouldn't be hard to connect, to connect with this here. Who are people going to vote for president, for Congress, for state legislature? And dutifully they give them the answers. Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. If you look at the answers given, the things that people are saying about who Jesus is are all incorrect. John the Baptist? John was put to death a couple of chapters earlier in Matthew's Gospel. Dead is dead, at least back in that state, at least back in that stage of the story. Surprisingly, someone as powerful as Herod himself, the ruler over Galilee, and the man responsible for executing John, had believed that Jesus was John, come back from the dead. An intriguing answer, but Elvis has left the building already. Jesus isn't John. Elijah? Elijah was seen as a forerunner, <clears throat> still is, during Passover meals to this day. An empty chair is left at the table in case Elijah would come. But Elijah had already come. That was John the Baptist who served as the forerunner. Jesus isn't Elijah. Jeremiah? Jeremiah was one of the prophets of ancient Israel who made, made it a point during the waning days of the kingdom of Judah to criticize the nation's religious and political leadership. Certainly Jesus wasn't bashful about being critical of either. But Jeremiah foreshadowed the ministry of Jesus, pointed to, pointed to it, but Jesus also wasn't Jeremiah. People's perceptions, perceptions of Jesus were wrong. We know it and we presume that the disciples knew it too. So much for the force of popular opinion. But then Jesus asked a second question, but who do you say that I am? This isn't just reportage or poll taking now. He wanted to know what they think and how they're thinking. He wanted to know what's going on in their minds, and unlike the average person on the street these days, have seen, they've seen enough to make some kind of judgment. They've watched Jesus heal all kinds of people. They watched Jesus take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000 people. They watched Jesus walk out with them, out to them on the water in the storm. Get Simon Peter to walk, with, walk out to him too and calm the storm. They watched him heal the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman. They had been with Jesus since his earliest days of his public ministry and held a front row seat to all of it. Okay, who do you say that I am? We don't know how much silence, if any, elapsed from the time Jesus asked the question to the time that Simon Peter answered it, but I would bet that there wasn't much. 
Simon Peter strikes me as the type that doesn't like silence and would try to fill the void as quickly as possible. Simon Peter, ever impul impulsive and impetuous, speaks up. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter swerves into the right answer, but it's not because of his own wisdom. Jesus knows this. He said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will prevail against it, will not prevail against it. And Simon Peter would be more right than he knew. He called Jesus the Messiah, but before the events of the cross, I imagined that he thought the Messiah would be a figure who would come in glory and would not come as a suffering servant. Simon Peter would eventually learn this, but not the right way. Simon Peter, with a lot of help from God, gets the right answer. Yet, friends, this is not a question that is just for the 12 disciples of Jesus to answer. It's a question that all followers of Jesus need to be asked and need to answer. And dare I say that it is a question that all of humanity in every age needs to answer. Who do we say that Jesus is? Now that may sound like an outrageous thing to say, but that is a question that all of the ages and all of humanity needs to answer. But I rarely don't think so. I really don't think so. For the things that Jesus said and claimed for himself, the things that he reportedly did compel us to make some kind of judgment, yes or no, about who Jesus is, indifference isn't really an option. I know that I've made reference to the famous trilemma of the legendary Christian writer and apologist C.S. Lewis posed to Jesus. That he had to be either a lunatic, a liar, or Lord. But I believe Lewis is spot on about this. He wrote in his book, Mere Christianity, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He is not left open to us. It is a question that each must answer. Some try to define Jesus as merely a person of his age and times. He's been seen as revolutionary, a mystic, and a healer. He's been one of the number of martyrs in the Jewish tradition. There are some who see him largely as a myth, and a good number of folks would like to create Jesus in their own image and conforming to their own biases. Who do we say Jesus is? May God give us each insight and wisdom to answer in the spirit of Simon Peter. Amen. Let us sing together, Lord, whose love through humble service.